I'm going to take a look at how to treat multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1. And I'll start off first by saying that it's a multiple endocrine neoplasia. That means it's a, it's a tumor of multiple different hormones secreting cells and or organs. So a lot of it is going to be the same treatment you would give for those specific kinds of tumors if they happened idiopathically, but there are some exceptions. First, I just want to take a look at the penetrance of the various different kinds of neoplasias. So first of all, we have the most, uh, the most common is parathyroid. It has a 95% penetrance in multiple endocrine neoplasia, type 1 that is. And then next would be uh, pancreatic problems. So it's, with this, the, the mnemonic is the three Ps. And what that means is you have pancreas, parathyroid, and pituitary. However, with the pancreas, most of the tumors are not uh, isolated to the pancreas. They will spread into the duodenum or into the pancreatic lymph nodes or lymph tissue. And even though it's the three Ps, you're going to get some other things in various other places and low frequencies. So for example, for gut carcinoids, you got 2, 4, and 10 percent penetrance on these uh, various types of tumors. With the pituitary, the most common is prolactinoma. Then you have non-functioning tumors being about equal to prolactin and growth hormone secretion at the same time. Growth hormone alo alone is only 5 percent, and then you can also get thyrotropin and ACTH. With the adrenal gland, Problems with the cortex almost never secrete cortisol. It's very, very, very rare. However, non-functioning tumors in the cortex are pretty off, uh, pretty common. And then less than 1% get a pheochromocytoma of the adrenal medulla. And then there are also several non-endocrine features, angiofibroma, collagenoma, lipoma, leomyoma, meningioma, and they're fairly common. With the non-endocrine features, it's surgery or not, and the choice on that is going to be based on if, if you would make the same choice despite whether it was multiple endocrine neoplasia. So make the same choice you would in any other case. Here in the picture, we have two uh, pictures showing angiofibromas on the lip and on the nose. When they're on the lip, it's often on the vermilion border of the lip. Now, here we got the parathyroid. So, I have a basic picture of your general uh, parathyroid on the thyroid gland. There is some anatomical variation, so you can have the parathyroid on the front of the thyroid gland. You can have it inside of the thyroid gland. You can even find parathyroid tissue within the chest and specifically within the thymus. These variations are important because the treatment for this is surgical removal. The two basic options are you can either remove three and a half of the four parathyroid glands, leaving one half of a gland there to prevent hypoparathyroidism, or in some cases you take off all of the parathyroid glands and then you take the most normal appearing tissue and re-implant it into the patient's arm, specifically their non-dominant arm. Thymectomies are typically done along with this surgery, and that's because it's a hiding place for the parathyroid. So you have two options now. Which one do you choose? So here's a breakdown of if you take one or the other. So if you do the three and a half uh, parathyroid removal, you have a higher frequency of recurrence. However, with autograft, you have a higher frequency of hypoparathyroidism. Also, with the three and a half removal, you have a, a higher failure to normalize, so 12%. And by normalize, what it means is after the surgery, do your calcium levels return to normal? And then also recurrence means your calcium levels did return to normal for at least three months, and then they changed and increased again. So the recurrence after 8 to 12 years is 44%. Failure to normalize after the surgery is 12%. However, the success with a second surgery is 90%. That, that refers specifically to if there's a recurrence. So if there's a recurrence, a second surgery will be successful 90% of the time. However, with the autograft, 
successfully removing that autograft is only about 60% of the time. You'll notice the strange absence of the information that I had right here. None of the sources that I found had this information for the autograft. So now let's talk about gastrinoma and its treatment. Gastrinoma, when it's due to a tumor, is often referred to as Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. And typically, Zollinger-Ellison syndrome or gastrinomas are due to the pancreas secreting too much gastrin. Gastrin has its effect on the stomach by increasing uh, the secretion of hydrochloric acid, and so you get increased gastric acids. With multiple endocrine neoplasia, only about 14% of these tumors are going to go on to cause further complications and, and metastasize. So the mainstay treatment with this is, is pharmacologic, and you'll give a proton pump inhibitor, uh, specifically omeprazole is the mainstay. However, you can also do surgery and surgically remove these things, and as our our localization procedures are becoming better and better. Surgeries on these are becoming more often. The problem with surgery is that with multiple endocrine neoplasia, these are typically not isolated to the pancreas. Usually you'll have these gastrinomas in the duodenum and also in the lymph tissue surrounding the pancreas. Now if you have an islet cell that is greater than three centimeters, that's an automatic go to surgery because of the high risk of malignancy. But other than that, PPI is the mainstay. Radiation and chemotherapy are considered palliative and they're reserved for advanced stages. But here's the neat thing as far as symptoms go calcium will reduce gastrin, or whenever you lower calcium, it will reduce gastrin secretion. So calcium will act on the stomach to increase the secretion of gastric acid, and it can do that both through a gastrin-dependent and gastrin-independent pathway. So just by fixing calcium, you're all automatically going to decrease the gastric acid secretion, and you also have a lower gastrin total uh, count in the serum. So even if this doesn't take away the entire problem, it can lower the dosage as needed for the medicine. So here's the thing with an insulinoma. They're pretty rare with multiple endocrine neoplasia. However, uh, when they do occur, different sources are going to tell you different things. Some say localize the insulin secreting tumor and remove it specifically, and there's a lot of great localization techniques, including uh, injecting calcium into various arteries and, and then checking for the insulin secretion in, that, uh, in the vein that comes out of it. Other sources are going to recommend complete surgical removal of the pancreas and then uh, using ex exogenous uh, hormones to treat the lack of insulin and glucagon and everything else, as well as exogenous enzymes for digestion. When a patient is a non-surgical candidate, you can treat it, the best you can treat it, with diazoxide or with uh, verapamil. However, with somatostatin analogs, it's, it's not really as effective with multiple endocrine neoplasia, so you would use diazoxide and verapamil, but you wouldn't be able to use somatostatin in most cases. Now, with all of the pituitary adenomas, you're going to treat these exactly the same as you would sporadic disease. The mainstay treatment for all the pituitary adenomas is transphenoidal surgery. You want to remove it using the transphenoidal approach. However, when that doesn't work, or if that's not possible for some reason, you can use bromocryptine for prolactinoma. So bromocryptine is a dopamine D2 receptor agonist, and it's going to act in that way to inhibit the secretion of prolactin. Now with growth hormone, let's talk about that. Uh, again, surgery is going to be the mainstay. The surgical failure rate with these uh, Pituitary adenomas, for a microadenoma, it's 13.3%. For a macroadenoma, it's 11.1%. When you have these failures, you move on to medical treatment. Now, the medical treatment for growth hormone is you're going to use octreotide or lantreotide, and you're going to use that with bromocryptine. 
the bromocryptine is going to act synergistically with the octreotide to inhibit growth hormone. And, of course, bromocryptine is used for the prolactinoma. So if you have both a growth hormone and prolactinoma, then the, bro uh, the bromocryptine is already going to be advised. But even without prolactinoma, add bromocryptine and it will reduce the total amount of either one of these medicines that need to be used. Now, if a patient is intolerant to this medication, you can use pegvis, uh, pegvisamant. However, the preferred are these two medications. When all else fails, you can use radiotherapy. And the big problem with this is you have a higher risk of hypopituitarism. So not just are we going to reduce the growth hormone, the prolactin hormone, we're going to reduce the function of the entire pituitary. So this is going to be your last line treatment. Okay, so adrenal adenoma. Now, if you have a pituitary adenoma, there's a very small chance that it is secreting ACTH, but this is pretty rare with multiple endocrine neoplasia. If that's the case, then your surgery should take care of everything and fix itself. On the other hand, if it's primarily an adrenal adenoma, most of the time these are non-functioning and they're not secreting glucocorticoids. Uh, and actually, pheochromocytoma is also very rare. However, in either case, you can do a bilateral, a bilateral adrenalectomy, and that should take care of any adrenal problems you have. In fact, it's going to cause a few problems. Multiple endocrine neoplasia, lastly, can cause many different kinds of non-functional tumors, and they can do it in many different places. And so the, the rule of thumb is that if it's less than 2 centimeters, you don't do surgery. If it's greater than 2 centimeters, you start considering surgery. And as always, you're going to weigh the benefits you get from surgery from the risks and complications of that surgery. And that's always going to be the driving decision.